Now on All Our FM, a special broadcast with George Matlock. Wywiad specjalny Orła FM prowadzi George Matlock. Hello and welcome. I'm George Matlock. Anglo-Polish Radio Or FM is delighted to have as a guest someone who might ably be described as the acceptable face of socialism. He served in Labour's shadow cabinet from 1986 to 94 and even stood for the Labour Party leadership in 1992 to succeed Neil Kinnock. Disagreement over the European Union led our guest to resign John Smith's shadow cabinet. He then quit as an MP on the 17th of May 1994 to return to his homeland, New Zealand. A former TV journalist, our guest has also been a director of TV uh, broadcaster TVNZ and has written a book. This month in the UK for the Labour Party conference, he has found a few minutes from his busy schedule to join listeners. A man who has fought against privilege most of his life, I hope he will forgive me for saying that it is a privilege to have him on air here. Brian Gould, hello and welcome. Yes, good morning. Well, it's great to have you here, and uh, on this reasonably sunny day, I'm glad that you were also able to capture some of the best weather we had uh, in about 10 years back in July on, on a holiday to the UK. Um, I wanted to, to get something cleared up right away, though, if I may. Um, you left British politics about five days after the Labour leader, John Smith, tragically died of a massive heart attack in '94. Why didn't you stay on to try for the leadership again? Well, that's a very good question, and of course many people have uh, noticed uh, that conjunction of events. Uh, but of course, I had announced in the February of 1994 uh, that I was going to go back to New Zealand to take up a job as uh, the uh, vice chancellor or president of a, of a university there. Uh, and it would have been a bit difficult, I think, for me to suddenly say uh, in May, uh, following the very tragic death of John Smith, oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to change my mind now. Uh, I now see an opportunity and um, I'm recommitting to British politics. I don't think that would have gone down very well. And, of course, it would have been a breach of faith with the people of New Zealand who'd offered me a very attractive position. Right, OK. Well, that does seem a, a very reasonable position to, to take. Um, obviously, uh, 20 years nearly since you, you left Old Blood. Um, and have you have you ever felt that you, you, maybe you should come back? I mean, may, maybe I should ask you this. Um, would you have been a Blairite had you remained in Westminster in 97? Well, that's a very good question, and I've sometimes asked it myself. I wouldn't have been a Blairite, I have to say. I knew Tony very well. In fact, I brought him onto the front bench initially when I was the uh, Shadow Secretary for Trade and Industry. I brought Tony onto the to my uh, uh, front bench team mm -hmm. uh, and got to know him quite well. And he was, he was always a very able young man and uh, clearly destined for greater things. But I must confess that I found his tenure as prime minister to be a disappointment. I thought the whole new Labour uh, experiment, as it uh, has seemed to be in retrospect, um, it was a disaster, really. It was a failed uh, opportunity uh, that passed us by. And uh, I, I think we simply kowtow to powerful people and the powerful forces in society instead of providing a reasoned critique of what was going on and trying to protect ordinary people. And what of the new leader, Ed Miliband? Uh, I know people say that he's failed to um, put his stamp on British politics and so on, uh, but I noticed uh, in The Guardian this morning, in fact, uh, an article by a former member, a senior member of the Liberal Democrats, who has uh, left the Lib Dems and within a month or two found it possible, indeed he found it necessary, as he put it, to join the Labour Party because he thinks Ed Miliband and his team are at least addressing the right issues. Now, if you ask me whether I think he's addressing them adequately, I'm afraid the answer is no, but no one's perfect in politics. Uh, and very few pol politicians ever get a 100% pass mark. Uh, I think Ed Middleband and his leadership team could afford to be a good deal more um, rigorous, a good deal more adventurous in convincing people that the way it's been for the last few years, and indeed for some decades now, is not necessary. We can avoid the traps that we've fallen into, and we can do... Uh, a, a great deal better if we only have the intellectual confidence, the courage, if you like, uh, to escape the trap, the constraints of uh, the 
current orthodoxy. We, we're going through, as though we're sleepwalking, really, the aftermath of a dreadful recession in which we're constantly told that the overwhelming priority is to reduce the government deficit. The government deficit is a symptom of our problems. It is not the problem. Uh, mm. we, we have huge problems of uh, high unemployment. We can't compete properly. We are losing uh, ground in world trade. We have a growing balance of payments deficit. All sorts of issues of that kind. Uh, and yet we are still focusing on this so-called necessity of getting the government deficit down. It would be very nice to have a lower government deficit. The way to get it down is to have a more buoyant and competitive and productive economy. Of course, winning elections is part of the, the package uh, that we would expect any politician to, to drive for. So I've got to ask you this. Um, wh whatever your own views, and, and indeed those of Britain, about Baroness Thatcher, she did come with a mandate. She did come with ideas. Admittedly, she reinvented many of them after the first few sort of very timid privatisations of Enterprise Oil and Amersham International to make it into a vote winner. But the point is, she did have a doctrine and she did have a vision of some sort. And uh, is that what, what's missing with the leadership of Ed Miliband today? I think it is. Uh, I, I, I think what you just said about uh, Margaret Thatcher is accurate, but it's often forgotten uh, that when she came to power, she herself, I think, had only a very hazy idea of what she wanted to do. I mean, she, she knew mm. where her, her own prejudices took her, as it were, uh, but she had the great benefit of inheriting or having have, had prepared for her an agenda uh, that was really the product of some uh, very, I think, um, excellent uh, political thinkers, people like Keith Joseph. Mm. One, one need not agree with him, but at least he'd prepared the ground. And there were many others, uh, you know, going back to philosophers like uh, uh, Hayek and, and, mm. um, uh, and uh, economists like Milton Friedman. The ground had been prepared for a quite substantial change, which turned into a kind of revolution. Now, mm. opinions will vary as to whether that revolution produced good results. Uh, I believe the long-term judgment will be that it didn't. But nevertheless, uh, Mrs. Thatcher was able, I think, to pursue an agenda prepared for her while her opponents were sort of scrabbling around, not knowing quite what to do about it. And you're absolutely right, I think, to draw a parallel between that experience of, of Margaret Thatcher and what is now needed for Ed Miliband. It's not something he can do all by himself. He needs, uh, and I've several times mentioned, a leadership team, people and people outside politics almost, certainly outside the Labour Party, preparing the ground, accustoming people uh, to the notion that there are other agendas. We don't have to accept the framework of austerity. That is not the mm. answer to our current problems. But at the moment, anyone who gets up and says that is running in a full tilt into the face of uh, an accepted orthodoxy that's been around for a long, long time now, which is you've got to have smaller government and a lower deficit. Well, it would be very nice to have a lower deficit, as I say, but the main thing we need is a more successful economy. A more successful economy will generate enough tax revenue to be able to deal with the deficit in a very effective way. So it sounds like really what uh, Ed Miliband has uh, fallen into the trap of doing is uh, effectively alienating many of the unions that uh, would claim that they helped him to win the leadership a few years ago and, and has not, uh, in the meantime, built up uh, a kind of electoral premium, if you will, um, of ideas that, that can, can carry, uh, carry him forward with the electorate. Um, now, you've written a book uh, called Myths, Politicians and Money, uh, the truth behind the free market. You have updated Labour's long-standing disquiet about capitalism to encompass the recession that we have endured since the debt crisis began in 2008, haven't you? I have. Uh, absolutely right. What I've done is uh, I've looked back over the past two or three decades, in fact, to uh, a precise date in 1989, when a political scientist called Francis Fukuyama uh, pronounced the end of history, uh, because with the fall of the um, of the Berlin Wall and the demise of the Soviet Union, uh, he thought that the, the, the way was clear um, for the, the absolute triumph of Western democracy and the free market. He saw no distinction between democratic political organization and the free market as an economic policy. Uh, and at that time, he, he failed to recognize the importance of Islam, didn't even know 
noticed China was emerging and so on. So it, it was, it, it's tough in retrospect to criticize him for things that no one really saw at the time. Nevertheless, what he failed to understand was that the real threat to democracy, and he saw no threat whatsoever, the real threat has come from within. It has come from the doctrine that the market must prevail and that those who can succeed in the market mm. um, call the shots. And that, that has the effect of sidelining democracy. The, the world economy, the global economy, is now run by major international corporations, which are passing into fewer and fewer hands. And they can simply ride roughshod over governments, sideline them altogether. And instead of standing up to that and, and defending the interests of ordinary people, our governments have tended to go along with, in fact, to eulogize the successes of uh, very successful business people who are walking off with the whole of the increased wealth that we've produced over the past three decades. Ordinary people have done very badly. Very, very wealthy people have captured all the new wealth. Uh, do you feel then that uh, US President Barack Obama's market reforms in 2010 uh, should have been taken completely out of the hands of those who allowed America to fall victim to such a highly leveraged uh, uh, system that, that, that then brought the, the House down in 2007? Well, you, that's again a very good question because we, paradoxically, although most people today have been convinced quite wrongly that the recession was created by bad economic policies on the part of governments, the real problem, the global financial crisis was, as you suggest, created by irresponsible banking. We, the taxpayers, have stepped forward to contribute our taxes to bailing the banks out. Uh, the banks continue to pay themselves huge salaries and bonuses, and they're even bigger today than they were at the time of the global financial crisis. In other words, we've learned nothing in that regard. Uh, and uh, we should, I think, be looking very seriously indeed at different ways of organizing our economy. Uh, most people don't understand, I think, that most money in our economy is created by the banks out of nothing. When the banks lend you uh, money on mortgage, for example, it's not real money. It's simply an entry in their, in their banking accounts. Uh, and so we, we are allowing the banks, which are, after all, just private companies making profits for their shareholders, we've allowed the banks to create most of the money in our economy. And in Britain, that money is applied to non-productive purposes. It doesn't go into new industry, new, new jobs, new technologies, or anything of that sort. It goes into house purchase. And that's why in London and the southeast in particular at present, you're seeing this huge rise again, mm. all over again, in property prices. Now, uh, staying with that theme, in, in the book you've contrasted the feudalism of the past based on social rules, sort of fast-forwarding past Karl Marx's vision of an industrial state, to the present day, which is a post-industrial world of high finance where bankers and privileged entrepreneurs have manipulated the market. So I've got to ask you this, uh, as it's very topical today, uh, so do you, do you take comfort from knowing that Larry Summers, uh, seen by some as an architect of the 2007 credit crunch as well uh, as one of its reformers, has bowed out of the race for the Federal Reserve. Yes, I noticed that, uh, that piece of news, I think, yesterday, wasn't it? And um, uh, it's, it's very significant, of course. It's not quite clear why he's done it. I suspect he's had the nod from Barack Obama to say that he's not going to be appointed, and so he stepped down. But you're quite right. Uh, Larry Summers, who's a brilliant economist, I believe would have been a good governor of the Federal Reserve. Uh, nevertheless has a, a record um, over the years preceding the global financial crisis, which doesn't give rise to very great confidence in him, because he was one of the architects of the um, huge um, increase in new financial instruments and new financial assets, uh, derivatives and, and so on, uh, which were the basis of the whole bubble of, of asset creation, which eventually burst and created the global financial crisis. I think we can accept, or at least I do, that he's learned a big lesson from that experience, but nevertheless, mm. it's a bit of an incubus on his sh shoulders uh, to take into being the head of uh, economic policy 
in the world's greatest economy. Well, let's take it now to the UK precisely. In your book, you've criticised the abuse of markets, but is there anything that a Labour government could have done in 2008? Could the then Finance Minister, Alistair Darling, have done more than bail out a few banks and set the tone for the Eurozone to follow suit? Well, I think uh, perhaps the finest and almost only achievement of Gordon Brown as Prime Minister uh, I have to say, I had had some hopes of Gordon as Prime Minister, but he was disappointing in that office. But perhaps his greatest achievement was that I think in the white heat of the crisis and the immediacy of that crisis, uh, he did at least take steps which stabilized things. Um, what, it, what he did was to ensure that there wasn't a domino effect in the whole banking sector, uh, that there wasn't going to be a total collapse uh, and, and perhaps you know, the worst economic crisis we've ever had. So I think Gordon Brown did very well on that occasion. But where we went wrong, uh, I, mean, I think the seeds of the problem went back a long way. Uh, and nothing that's happened since uh, has shown or suggested that we've learned the lessons of, of, that, uh, of that disaster. We, we, we shouldn't have ever allowed ourselves to become so dependent on the city of London, which was itself based on, in many respects, on assets of very little value. Uh, there were assets that had a market value as long as the market was prepared to accept their face value. But as soon as it became clear that many of those assets were based on um, debts that people couldn't repay, uh, then the, the loss of value of those debts, of course, what of, of those assets, rather, uh, was what caused the global financial crisis. We should never have allowed that to happen. I can go back to the Financial Services Act in the 1980s, the time of the Big Bang in the city, when I led for the Labour Party opposition uh, on that piece of legislation and warned that light regulation or self-regulation would not work. We were, were far too lax in allowing financial institutions to develop assets that really, in the end, had no value. Now, the Bilderberg Group was founded 60 years ago by, among others, a Polish politician in exile, Josef Rettinger. Its most recent annual meeting was held, perhaps surprisingly, in Watford near London. Are you suspicious of cosy meetings like those and of what Professor John Galbraith once called the military-industrial complex? Well, yes, I am. I mean, I'm, one can't object to people getting together if they so choose with people of like mind, and, and why not? Uh, but... I don't believe these people are badly intentioned, but they do reinforce a sort of groupthink. Uh, the Bilderberg Conference is one, the Davos uh, group meeting is another. There was at some point, I don't know whether it still exists, something called the Trilateral Commission. These are all uh, meetings of people who see themselves as the captains of industry on a global scale and the leading uh, institutions and financial institutions and governments and politicians. And they get together and they tell each other how well they're doing and uh, how correct they are in, in the policies they're applying. Um, and it's simply a way of reinforcing an orthodoxy, which the Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz uh, called the Washington Consensus. And that is the notion that markets must prevail, um, that governments must have very limited uh, input, uh, that the only task of economic policy is to control inflation, uh, that once you have stabilized the value of your currency, uh, you, you shouldn't ever look at questions like competitiveness and so on, you should stabilize the currency and then let business get on with it. It's the notion that businessmen know best and that everything has a price. And those, I think, are the doctrines that have very seriously led us astray. So to the extent that the Bilderberg uh, group uh, has reinforced that, then I think it's regrettable. But you can't blame the participants. They have a nice time, no doubt. <laughs> In Watford. Um, now, Poland has uh, uh, been one of the countries that uh, I suppose you could say almost would describe this whole crisis as pretty much foreign to them. Uh, the banks had hardly any exposure to Wall Street in 2007, and lenders have always been very astute to prevent you know, a local bubble from building up. Yeah. Um, Poland, as you may know, is the only economy that did not fall into recession in Europe in the past five years. Are, are there any lessons, do you think, that the world can learn from some country like that? Well, I think in a curious way, and I'm sure many of your listeners who 
you're interested in Poland will be surprised to hear me say that in this one respect, at any rate, there are parallels between my own homeland of New Zealand and Poland. New Zealand um, fell very briefly into recession, but essentially has come through more or less unscathed because we had a very stable banking system. Mm. Uh, and we also had markets in Australia and China, particularly, which were very buoyant and you know, which motored on through the recession. Uh, and I think what that shows is uh, that if you can keep your financial system reasonably stable, um, then you, you, you can avoid the most serious and, and short-term effects of, of a financial collapse. Um, but that doesn't tell you, and I, you will know more about the Polish economy than I do, that doesn't tell you that you are going to sail on blithely, uh, doing wonderfully well in New Zealand, and I suspect in Poland as well. We may have avoided recession, but are we recovering from, from the setback uh, on the basis of policies and, and on the basis of economic development that are sustainable? In, in, a, in New Zealand, and I see increasingly in Britain as well, uh, such recovery as there is, is based on uh, a, another bout of asset inflation, particularly in house prices. Mm. Uh, and the problem with that is that your recovery is based on policies which lead you straight back into your long-term difficulties of balance of payments deficits and the threat of inflation. And the reason that we cannot escape from recession uh, faster than we have done is that if we grow, then we will run into those problems again of inflation and balance of payments problems, uh, and therefore we dare not grow. Uh, so unless we can grapple with those problems, uh, recovery is going to be short-lived and based on, a, on shifting sands. Now, turning to um, another interesting issue for our listeners, uh, was Tony Blair right to allow Poles and others from the EU accession countries to come to Britain in 2004, or should um, we have delayed them the same way as Germany did? Well, uh, I have to say, as now a, a visitor to the UK, although a frequent visitor, <laughs> uh, I find that um, the arrival of Poles and other Eastern Europeans has actually revolutionized the British economy in one important sense. It has become a much more consumer-oriented uh, economy. Uh, there was a time 10, 15 years ago uh, when uh, the British economy was run very much in the interest of producers rather than consumers. Uh, you, you, you did what your supplier told you, uh, you know, even at the, the retail level or in restaurants or or pubs and cafes and so on, mm. but with, with I think, well-educated, hard-working Poles and other Eastern Europeans, now very evident in the British economy, the whole level of service and, uh, and of efficiency uh, in delivering that service uh, has risen very considerably. So whether that was, I mean, in, in the end, I think, if you, if you were a member of the European Union, you had very little option um, uh, but but to allow people to, to come, I think. Um, well, we could have held them off. I mean, there was a, there was a, a, a tapering period where yes, you know up, yes. up to seven years, and some countries were not immediate to uh, to, uh, to rise to the occasion. I mean, no, I, I know that Ireland moved very quickly with Britain, but Sweden mm. joined them very soon afterwards. But again, only after a, a point of apprehension. So yes. I suppose you could say that you know, and France was uh, I, I think delayed them for about five years. So yes, yes. You know, they, we, we could have held out longer if we felt that was the right thing to do. Well, I think it's, it's, I think on the one hand, I would resist any notion that uh, uh, immigrants are a bad thing. I think immigration has always occurred into Britain and has, on the whole, been um, a great stimulus to the development of British society and the British economy. On the other hand, I think it's also quite legitimate to take account of the interests of those who are already resident here uh, and have been, have been for some time, and to, to say that uh, some tapering would, would be helpful. In other words, give people a, a chance and give the economy a chance to absorb uh, a new wave of, of settlers who are both contributors to the economy and consumers from the economy. Uh, an economy that is, that is accepting a certain rate of immigration uh, tends to do very well because it's a stimulus to economic activity and so on. So 
so to to put the shutters up would be quite wrong and I think would have been illegal anyway under the EU rules. But to taper, I think, would have been helpful and may well have allayed some of the public concern and opposition to the influx of immigrants. Now, uh, in final question. Uh, in your book, uh, you discuss how tax revenues have in some cases fallen during the recession. Um, given Labour's and the Liberal Democrats' keenness to introduce a mansion tax, a kind of rates, if you will, but on properties worth £2 million plus, it's clear that avoiding that tax won't be easy. But with property prices rising as successive governments do nothing to curb the real causes of a property bubble, are you in favour of a tax which will affect middle-income earners within a few years, rather like inheritance tax did? Well, I'm certainly uh, very concerned to avoid um, raising taxes uh, unnecessarily or unfairly. Uh, I, I'm certainly in favour of a, a, a buoyant tax revenue uh, that will fund uh, effective public services. Uh, but I don't think you achieve that by delving further down the income scale uh, to to place an increased tax burden on on middle income people. So if if you were looking at a tax on expensive properties, I think you would first of all have to watch very carefully where you put the level at which uh, that liability began. In other words, you'd have to keep it up to date with uh, what's happening to property values. But I think, I, I mean, this takes us right back to my own period in British politics when I was the Labour Party spokesperson on the poll tax at the time of that, the, that great controversy. And uh, I was very keen at that point, and I still think it's possible to do this, to maintain a rates, a local tax based on property, uh, because I think that has some considerable uh, social and economic benefits, but to link that, link the liability or the rate at which that is paid to income. Now, with modern uh, uh, um, computerization, mm. it's certainly possible uh, to link people's income tax returns to their rates payments. In other words, if, you have, if you're living in a, a valuable property but with uh, little by way of income, then your rate could well be reduced on the basis of your low level of income. And I think you could, in other words, I think we need much more flexibility in this kind of taxation. Uh, and certainly just a blanket tax on anyone with a property over a certain value would have to be watched very carefully to make sure it wasn't producing adverse results. And, the, and as property values rose, so that point at which the liability to tax uh, increased mm. would have to be raised. Yes, it's very often people's only ash actual asset. And if you think about it, those who are incredibly rich uh, will find ways around it. They always do. Well, I can think right. of a pretty obvious one, uh, which I know a few members of Parliament uh, have uh, managed to succeed in doing that, is simply to spread your risk. You buy several properties at a million pounds each. Uh, you can easily have 10 or 20 or 100 of those. Uh, and they would not, uh, by the current uh, definitions of this uh, mansion tax, would, would not fall liable to such taxation. So again, uh, you, you could become a, a very rich landlord and, and never actually have to uh, pay a penny of it. Uh, considerable things to think about. Um, and uh, now uh, uh, the, the book Myths, Politicians and Money uh, is published uh, by Palgrave Macmillan and is out now. Uh, Brian Gould, it's been a pleasure to speak with you on Aura FM. Thank you very much.